Um, hi, everybody. Uh, it's great to be able to join you virtually, and I'm very sorry that I'm not there in person. Um, and uh, following on the heels of Tony's presentation, I would like to say, too, that I very much appreciated WHO's leadership um, in this area. And today, as Joan said, I'm going to be talking about what I see as one slice of the puzzle, um, or one piece of the puzzle and one slice of the pie, um, having to do with children's readiness to learn um, at the start of school and also the quality of their learning environment. Um, so the project that I'm going to be describing for you today is really focused on oh. developing measurements one I'm second, um, Abby, we're getting your slides up. Do you, you have them? Okay. We did test this, so I'm hoping it works. Abby, could you please share your desktop? Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so, in, in where I left off, so I'm going to be talking you, to you today about a project uh, that's focused on children's readiness to learn. Um, and our goal is to develop approaches to measurement for both the quality of learning environments and child learning and development for children between the ages of four and six, with an emphasis on developing tools that are appropriate for low income countries. And when I'm talking about the measurement of quality of learning environments, for this project, we're going to be beginning with uh, preschool and early primary school environments. Um, in some countries, that could be formal classrooms. In others, it might be informal. We recognize that that's a limited scope in terms of children's learning environments, to Tulum and Jones' previous point. Um, but I think for feasibility purposes, we're going to be beginning there with hopes that our uh, findings will have implications in other spots, too. So this project really arose from a mandate from the Learning Metrics Task Force. So this is a good example of an education sector approach. Um, the Learning Metrics Task Force was convened by the Brookings Institution and UNESCO Institute for Statistics to do some visioning work on what measurement of education should look like. And of their recommendations, measuring children's readiness to learn, which was their phrase, was one of their recommendations. Uh, this, in a lot of ways, represents the need for the education sector to have such a clear emphasis on the importance of students' development uh, prior to, to beginning formal schooling. So in response to this mandate, UNESCO joined a partnership with the World Bank and the Brookings Institution and UNICEF uh, to begin work. Um, we're starting now. We're in the very early stages uh, with the goal of being able to field test in early 2015 and complete the project by 2016, meaning that we would have outlined approaches to measurement. Um, that could be used in other settings by that time. Um, we're envisioning four field testing countries in Africa and Latin America. So given that the emphasis in terms of indicators is, uh, is often on the global, I, I thought I'd take a minute to, to, to describe why we're focusing on national level measurement. I think that we all appreciate the incredible value that comes from being able to track globally. We're focusing on national assessments for this project um, because we see that they can be longer, more frequent, and adapted to local settings, and that those are advantages for improving the quality of children's learning environments um, and their learning and development in, in many countries. However, there are drawbacks. Um, because we anticipate adapting these items to local settings, they won't contain the same set of items necessarily across all countries, so they may not be considered globally comparable. We do see local data as being important for policy and programmatic development. In particular, the design of curricula, which are often linked to national standards, connections with teacher training uh, institutions, which are, are often also national, um, informing policies, funding decisions, and then also providing detailed information on inequities within countries. It may be possible to use these measures to inform global tracking over time. For example, by reporting on the percentage of children who reach um, the standards outlined by a country or the percentage of learning environments that meet quality standards, things along those lines, or to use a common set of core items across a number of different countries. And we will be investigating both of those options as our project unfolds. So underneath this is a core assumption that I think Simon articulated very well, um, too, is that the importance of measuring in terms of contributing to improvement and that we're envisioning these data as being useful in improving the learning environment through policies, teacher support, parent information, and also for advocacy. 
So um, one way to that we're conceptualizing the data from this project from this project is that the quality of the learning environment and the child development and learning really needs to be measured in tandem. So that um, as children said, that the, to the importance of looking at a number of different contextual factors, um, we realize that this is this is one piece. Um, but yet, what we're trying to do in this project is really figure out how the data can be collected and used, and how the measures can be designed to inform one another. Um, and this is a central goal of, of what we're trying to accomplish. So then in sum, the vision of what we hope to achieve is a goal of free open source items that allow easy use and adaptation across countries. The early grade reading assessment has been a tremendous, um, a tremendous asset to us in that, that that tool has been adopted in many places and seems to be easy to adapt. So we're following guidance from them as well as from many other successful efforts um, in measurement. We will be placing quite a bit of emphasis on designing it with the users in mind from the start. Um, and that we also are placing a strong emphasis on, on its use in improving learning environments. Um, and so then together, coming up with something that's both flexible and feasible and provides ongoing information. So that's all good and fine. And then the question becomes, what will it take to really build that? Um, and we have two things that we're focused on, the content. And of course, ensuring that the construct is scientifically valid and relevant, that the items are reliable and they're accurate and technically sound. And then emphasis on teachable and actionable items. So then really trying to select items that teachers and schools um, and parents and other ECD stakeholders in the country can use to improve children's learning environments. Um, and then again, on the usability of how it will be designed, there are many questions around how the data will be selected, whether it's appropriate to use direct observation, whether a parent or teacher report might be useful, if it's a household survey, if it's in a classroom. And we have yet to resolve all of those decisions at this point. And finally, how the results will be shared and used to improve practice. So there are a number of risks associated with data, um, particularly that there could be some chance of, high, of a high stakes system of either using the data to penalize teachers uh, or community-based preschool settings for not reaching certain standards of quality or for uh, assuming that a child is quote, not ready for school and then actually encouraging inequity as opposed to trying to reduce inequities. Um, and we see this as something that's very important to keep into account. Um, using population-based data is helpful, uh, but it doesn't go the whole way. So that will be another important focus of our work with country stakeholders. I wanted to give you a bit of an overview of existing measures of child development and learning. Um, I think that these will be familiar to many people in the room. And just to give you some sense of the process that we're using in, in trying to build our work on the tremendous expertise that already exists. So on the y-axis, you see the population to the country level, meaning that at the, at the higher um, that, uh, on the y-axis are measures that were really designed for use at the global level. Um, so then they may have fewer items. They may not necessarily be intended to be adapted to local and national standards, for example, um, but then are, are usable across a very wide range of countries. Um, and then at the bottom, the countries that, or the measures that were designed in response to national standards, the East Asia Pacific Child Development Scales, probably being one of the best examples of that, that was really developed based on national standards and so therefore is usable in a number of Asian countries um, that uh, it has a different focus. Um, and then there are another, a number of other measures in between. And um, we really appreciate all of the great thinking that has gone into all of them. This too, uh, this slide here shows a little bit of the process that we intend to take. I won't go through all of the words here because this is a really wordy slide. Um, but basically what I'm starting with at the top are the constructs that are important to measure, um, which are based both on scientific literature and then also input from people within countries about what they see is really important. Um, then reviewing the literature, identifying the various measurement options, identifying a wide set of items that could be potentially useful, field testing, and validating. For child development and learning, there's a, a strong basis of expertise to draw upon. In quality, there's also been a, a lot of really great work done. But at this point in time, the, that work hasn't necessarily been translated into measurement in quite the same way that child development and learning has. So uh, while they may follow the same process, the two are not necessarily in the same stage of development. So as has been mentioned earlier in some of our presentations and commentary, we see field testing and validation as being absolutely critical um, and recognize all of the risks that go along with that. Um, we will be addressing both content and use in the field testing process. 
Um, here are some of the tensions that we feel that we're addressing as we move forward. The technically strong data that may be expensive to collect and require highly trained observers may not be usable and therefore won't need to change. So we need to come up with something that's feasible, but at the same time, rough and accurate measures that may be really cheap and very easy to collect might not be the basis for effective use. Finally, what we see is that measures that align with country priorities will motivate users and probably inspire more data collection over time so that then there's another dimension of trying to make sure that whatever we um, design is something that really resonates with the people who might be using it. We see some of the anticipated issues then of coming up with the common core of items, which I mentioned briefly earlier, or the idea that we could embed a certain set of common items and use across countries, which then could be globally comparable. Um, whether that's possible while also adjusting to local context is a, is a question that we'll explore. Um, and in terms of validation, I think that, that the questions of, of validation become critical also because the concurrent validity is less expensive and um, probably a little bit easier to get. And the predictive validity, which is probably one of the most critical pieces, is much harder. It takes longer and is more expensive. Um, so we're going to have to figure out, too, how we address that tension going forward. And then finally, I want to end on the note saying that we really are very interested in drawing on the tremendous expertise that's already been developed in this area. Um, so I'm looking forward to the comments um, from, from this opportunity to share this with you and also encourage you to be in touch um, with, by email with either me or any of the other organizations that are represented, um, Brookings Institution, World Bank, UNICEF, to share your thoughts um, and to give us your feedback on how we can uh, does something that will really work. Thank you very much. Thank <clears throat> Thanks, Abby. I know we had a little bit of a challenge hearing with clarity. Um, so, Abby, I, I don't know if you're using a speaker, but for questions, you might uh, speak directly into a into a phone line because that okay. may help. Um, okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So I'm going to move us on to Patricia. Obviously, um, what Abby was saying is they're still in the process of the development of these, and we can come back to questions about that. 